There's nothing people love more in their laid-back, fun-focused games than being in massive debt. Whether moving into a town full of cute animals or spreading the good word of capitalism, every happy-go-lucky setting needs players to have a goal in the far-off distance to work towards. And one of the least stressing ones imaginable always comes back to being in massive debt and needing to pay this back. So naturally, when Capcom decided to make a prequel spin-off of the vibrant Mega Man legends focusing on the Bond family and their goofy serve bots, the story had to be about a gigantic debt that was well overdue. So, did you get all that? Um... Not really... During the opening mission, Tiso Bon attempts to explore an old ruin in the hopes of striking it rich as soon as possible, while putting Tron Bon's latest work, the Goose Staff and the Gasol Shaft, to the test. During the mission, he gets kidnapped by a loan shark, revealing that he defaulted on a loan of 1 million zenny, leaving Tron to pay his debts in his place in the hopes of saving him from a life in prison. This is what starts the misadventures of Tron Bon. The misadventures of Tron Bon! The Misadventures of Tron Bon is a game split into multiple segments in a very direct way. Between missions, you move Tron around on the Gessel Shaft through menu options, interacting with your army of 40 serve bots scattered through the various rooms aboard the ship. You start with the HQ, lab, storage, cafe, meeting room, and gym opened up while the rest is still under construction, but as you progress through the game, more rooms open up, unlocking more serve bots in the process. A lot of rooms have special functions as well, like how the lab lets you buy and develop equipment by giving items to certain serve bots. The cafe has a special serve bot who can tell you what interactions or stat growth certain serve bots need to develop their special skills. The storage room lets you sell items, and the meeting room is the backdrop for the mission select room, but also unlocks the ability to change colors on the goose staff if you've given the right serve bot the right item. Though there isn't that much to explore aboard the ship, it is nice interacting with the real stars of the show, the serve bots. Is this the bank? All right, open the doors. Yes, it's strong. It's it's a couple of dogs. <laughs> There's been a lot of minion group characters out there over the years, and a lot of them have this cynical sense of design and comedy behind them that is pretty much lacking from them. They're just good-natured, hard-working, and incredibly dumb and lacking in confidence. For a group of villains that literally break and enter houses, rob banks, and attack police on sight, they're incredibly childlike in how pure they are and how they interact with the world surrounding them. Speaking of the world surrounding them, let's talk missions. There's three major mission types in this game, and they all represent their own gameplay style. There's action, RPG, and puzzle. There's also the free mission, and a secondary version of the action and puzzle that unlock later into the game. Action is a series of missions in which you rob a bank with the goose staff and a small group of serve bots while running from the police. Out of the mission types, this is my favorite one to play. You send your serve bots into buildings to rob them, you get to throw cars around, shoot down police cars, and get a minor sub-story following a police officer down on her luck, hoping that stopping you will be her big break. Not. 
RPG is a first-person dungeon crawler in which you go down a cave looking for a mythical treasure set to be hidden inside it. Along the way, you interact with NPCs, fight a few enemies, and send your surf bots to disarm traps. I quite like the characters and story in this segment, and it's a shame that there is so little of it. There's some minor progression hidden away in here too, with a small drilling machine and upgrade swords scattered through the dungeon. These missions typically take the longest, which is traded off with there being less RPG style missions in the game than the other types. Puzzle mode. You drive around a modified version of the Goose Staff, picking up crates and moving them around. There's a number of special crates on the map you need to bring back to your ship, and you can only move a small number of steps while holding them. The metal crates blocking the path are too heavy to move around after lifting them, so you can only pick them up and place them after turning in other directions. You also have wooden crates that have no movement limit after picking them up and can be placed anywhere. Crates can also be thrown in the water to create small bridges to walk over. There's also a limit of how many times you're allowed to pick up any crates, and a special extra crate that gives you a bonus amount of money when collected. Later editions also feature cranes that let you move crates around without being lifted, and a forklift that lets you move target crates to the ship after having moved everything out of the way. Later on there's also conveyor belts. It's a solid puzzle game by itself, and each stage consists of multiple sub-stages, so it's technically the mode with the most content. After you collect the 1 million zenny you needed to pay off your debt, it turns out that the Lone Shark isn't going to let Teasel Bond go so easily, doubling the figure after calculating the interest on the spot. From here on, a bunch of extra missions open up. You get one new set of puzzle missions and a secondary action mode. The new puzzle missions are mostly the same as the old ones, but the new action mode feels like a downgrade. Instead of robbing a bank, you steal farm animals to sell off, sending your surf bots after the animals and running in their way to corner them. While the surf bots carry the animals back to the truck, you have to defend them from harm, or else they'll let go of the animal and you have to restart the process. The final mission style involving horses is incredibly frustrating because of how annoying the horses are to corner and how many homing enemies lock onto the surf bots the moment that they grab them. Not to mention how the mission structure itself doesn't sound as fun as robbing a bank in general. There's also no story segments or characters you meet during this. You don't really get chased by the police, just by a bunch of robots. It just feels thrown in, unfinished, compared to all the other modes in the game. Besides this, there's the free mode. This is essentially just the action mode again, but instead of a sequence of missions with a clear goal, you set out to finish the mission that Teasel was kidnapped during at the start of the game, exploring old ruins while searching for treasure. I quite like this dungeon, and I wish there was more of it. Maybe add a second floor or a second dungeon, because as it is, it's a set of rooms with important items for surf bots aboard the gasoline shaft that, while fun, doesn't really amount to too much. This mode in particular has the problem where one of the last weapons that you get during the action modes just isn't fun to use at all, and it's the one that ends up being absolutely necessary during the free mode to progress. The rocket launcher has a slow rate of fire, bad range, and locks you in place as you shoot, which becomes an extra big problem in the small confines of the rooms that you're locked in while exploring these ruins. The rocket launcher can break walls with cracks in them, which helps you get a couple of important items and lets you progress through the rest of the dungeon, so you're forced to use it at some point. If I had one main issue with the misadventures of Tron Bon, it's that I wish there was a third act to its progression, giving you more stages to explore and more interactions with the surf bots aboard the gasoline shaft. I have the feeling this was the original intent, since there's a few rooms aboard the ship that never made it into the final game that have been found in the game's files, and the structure of the final mission feels like it's a sequence of action missions slapped together, while even most of the plot during it more or less hints at a further increased interest on the depth. Though I think generally wanting more of a game doesn't make it a bad one. For the problems that I've mentioned about the later parts of the game, it's still incredibly fun and overflowing with charm.
especially if you use the simple control scheme. In an interesting twist, the game's two control schemes have one that's simple for beginners and one that is aimed at experts, with the main change between the two being strafing and turning being set to the directional buttons or shoulder buttons. And wouldn't you know it, the one aimed at beginners feels a lot closer to modern 3D games now. There's also a fairly simple lock-on feature that's pretty consistent in its use. For an early 3D action game, it's quite amazing how right Capcom got it during the PlayStation 1 era, and a lot of what I said about the controls also counts for Mega Man Legends. Speaking of early 3D, the low polygon look of the Mega Man Legends series is really special to behold, even to this day. It's a shame this game won't play nicely with upscaling on emulators, breaking borders and textures quite frequently when you attempt it. This isn't just an issue with emulators on PC, the PlayStation 3's emulated version has the same texture problems. Thankfully, the game itself looks great naturally, so even without massive upscaling, the game looks gorgeous to this day. There's also this huge charm in the cheesy voice acting of the game, especially the few moments Teasel gets to talk and chew the scenery. I went to all that trouble and spent all that money to get this treasure map. It's a fake! Though it is hard to sing the praises of the voice actor considering he was found guilty of owning child pornography, even admitting to it and pleading guilty. This is real. Google it if you don't believe me. There's also something really special about the serve bots. The slow paced and stiff acting actually fits their characterization a lot. Not yet! Why don't you try digging here? You can get through to the other side that way. Nice of him. Be sure to thank him properly. Thank you. We're surf bots. Nice to meet you. All in all, The Misadventures of Tron Bon is still an incredibly fun game to this day, full of charm and memorable segments. Although I have some misgivings with the second set of action missions due to the nature and goal of the game, you can progress through it and beat the game without playing them just by focusing on the puzzle missions instead since all you need to get to the end is the right amount of money. Or if you disagree with me and hate puzzles but love capturing farm animals for some reason, the reverse holds true as well. When a game has drastically different gameplay styles, it's often a good idea to not force all of them on a player and instead let them choose which ones to do, giving some leniency to or saving some for later or doing a bare minimum of them. Anyway, this was above up. I hope you enjoyed this video. This video, as always, has been brought to you by people on Patreon. There are the people scrolling on the screen right now. If you would love to become one of the scrolling names on the screen, you can pledge on Patreon. But yeah, this was Above Up, and I will uh, see ya. Country localized entirely within your kitchen. Yes. Wrong! <laughs>